Good morning. Sorry, I'm a little tired today. It's working, so, but I'm very excited though, because uh, that's a new topic. We never talked about this before. It's the first time. Um, so today we're going to talk about TEE, or also known as transesophageal echo. Uh, my name is Lori, as you know, and um, in terms of whoops, the objective for this presentation, we're basically going to go a very brief overview. I know again, just like I said, that's my last presentation. This is kind of an advanced topic, but it's actually good to know because we're going to have it very soon at the Jewish. And I think it's something that you start, you should start having an introduction and start reading about because it's actually very interesting. And it's definitely part of the future of uh, point of scale ultrasound. So in terms of the objective, we're going to go over what are the indications, the current indications and the potential indications for TEE in the ED. I'm going to briefly describe to you how the transducer works because it's a particular transducer. I'm going to briefly talk about the sequence um, that one day you're definitely going to learn and then describe a little bit the views and what we're looking for. At any time, if you have questions, just open up your mic and tell me because I don't really see the comments uh, right now. There we go. In terms of the indications, so um, TEE in the ED, I, I would say really has three um, major indications currently. But the first one, and really the one that is the best described in the literature and well accepted, is the use of TEE in cardiac arrest. Um, TEE in cardiac arrest has been actually quite well studied so far, uh, has been shown to be very um, helpful, but also feasible for us in the emergency department. Another one would be your shocky patient who's intubated and whom you're not really sure what's going on, or the patient with ROSC that you brought back that is an ECMO candidate, that you want to have this continuous live monitoring and be able to answer multiple questions uh, while the patient has multiple instrumentation going on, perhaps a Lucas device still on, uh, where TTE might be more difficult. And then the last indication that I would say is definitely something that you've probably heard about is uh, for the diagnosis of aortic dissection. So we all know that some of the patients are way too unstable to go for a CT scan. They would code in a CT if you send them. Well, you know we're reading that T is actually one of the tools that you can use for those unstable patients in whom you suspect an aortic dissection. Um, it takes a bit of practice, but I think it's going to be in the realm of the emergency physician um, in the near future. But let's focus on ED, uh, TEE for cardiac arrest for today. So let's see a little bit about the difference. So I'm just going to put that down. Okay. So why are we bothering? Okay, I'm sure you guys are using TTE right now and you're like, it's working very well. But with the literature that we've had in the last few years, remember that the problem with TTE is that we really take too long to get the views to answer our questions. Sometimes the pulse check will be more than 10 seconds because we're trying to get a nice TTE view. And you know that the image quality is high variable. You need to be good at it. You need to have a good window, not a pneumonia dystynum in the case of uh, Xavier presented, for example. So the image quality is highly variable when you're leading a code. The, the, the other thing is you're not able to get live feedback when you're doing CPR, right? The hands are in the way. There's no way you're going to get an accurate um, image, an accurate image to be able to interpret it. The other thing is, honestly, you're going to put gel all over. And I find that during codes, I always use my TTE and then I have to wipe down quickly all the gel because the PAB, the nurse, or the doctor who's going to do the compression is really going to struggle if you're leaving all this gel over the chest. TEE will basically help you uh, overcome all of these issues. TEE will always get you, or almost always get you, a superior image quality. It's like um, an HD uh, television show that you're seeing. So a great image quality, not as grainy as the TEE, because you're right in there. You are getting the view super close to the heart with a very high frequency probe. You're also going to be able to get live feedback, right? You're not able to scan during CPR with the TTE, but with TEE, the probe is there all the time. So you, can, you don't have to do anything. It's just there, sitting there, for you to interpret whenever you decide to look at the screen of your ultrasound machine. And honestly, it's way easier to acquire the images than TTE. Once the probe is inserted, let me tell you, it is quite easy to get the images. Oh, let's talk about the transducer that I call the Sonosnake. This is a TEE probe here to the left of the screen. Uh, so very nice. You can see that you got some um, um, little uh, deroulettes here. Um, you're going to have the probe that is this very long thing right here. And the surface that actually they get all the images is actually that little tiny surface right here. So this is a TEE probe into the snake, just in case you guys wouldn't really, you know, be able to make the distinction. 
And then for you nerds in the audience uh, or R5 that will need to know this, or maybe not for the exam, is that a venomous uh, snake, yes or no? And I'm not able to see the chat actually when I'm in full screen like this. Yeah, I do see the scan. Let me check. Oh, red on yellow something something. So it's actually red on yellow will kill a fellow. So this is not anonymous. And then red on black, venom lack. Okay, now you know. Very good. So at least you, rem you, you will learn something today <laughs> regarding snakes. So um, just to go back, the TEE Pro basically acts like a snake. And then honestly, I found a snake in my brother's room because I'm, I live at my parents right now. And then, you know, snakes, they have these movements when they can do get, like lateral movements like this. I don't know if you can see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lateral movements like this, but they can also do these up and downs with their head, right? They're very articulated. Well, that probe has exactly the same function and we're going to go over them right now. So you're going to see that this probe compared to other probes has functions on top of the transducer. So you're going to have some um, wheels for which you're going to be able to turn and get what we call these lateral flexions, right? So you're going to go right and left, right and left, and anti-flexion, up and down, up and down. These are kind of fancy movements that you're pretty much never going to use. The only button that I would say that is important for us in the emergency department is called the omniplane. It's right, um, I hope you can see my, my mouth, but it's pointed with that big yellow uh, arrow. The omniplane is really the biggest difference between any type of probe that you've ever seen. The omniplane basically will take the, um, the probe, um, so the ultrasounds, and will kind of turn them. So the omniplane will do some sort of a rotation like this. So you're gonna be able to increase your angle or decrease your angle. So by default, the omniplane is always going to be like this, zero degree. But then as you're increasing, and we're going to, you're going to see on some of the images you're going to recognize, you're going to be able to acquire some different images depending on the angle that you're giving it. So that's pretty much the only thing that you're going to be um, using whenever you do TEE. The probe insertion is the biggest or the most difficult part of doing TEE. Why? It's because you can have complication more with probe insertion. And although it think, you know, you think, you know, an orogastric tube is pretty much is pretty easy to put in whenever your patient is intubated, the TEE probe is a little bit bigger. And then sometimes it's not going to be that easy. And you definitely don't want to be that emergency physician who will do an esophageal perforation because you've not done it in the proper way. So just as a quick thing, whenever you decide to do TEE uh, in the ED, your patient has to be intubated. Okay, that's the number one. It has to be. And again, for now, we're going to keep to cardiac arrest patient, refractory, um, that you have ongoing CPR and you want to have some answers and do actually an, an, optimal, um, um, an optimal resuscitation. Let's go for a TEE probe insertion. Your patient is intubated. You're going to go ahead and intubate um, and put the TEE probe. The TEE probe insertion, you really want to make sure that you um, are going in the esophagus, first of all. So that's something that we can definitely uh, do. But I would say that use your, your laryngoscope, right? The patient is intubated, grab your laryngoscope, grab your video laryngoscope, uh, your glidescope, for example, and have a direct visualization of the esophagus and go there. Um, it is very important that you need to lift the jaw uh, to create some space in the mouth. So sometimes, actually, in the OR, I did a bit of training for TE as a resident. You basically grab the jaw, you lift it up to really create this space in the hypopharynx so you can really have an approach angle that is less of an acute thing than if you don't lift the jaw. And then you reduce your risk of injury, the, um, uh, of injuring the tongue or the back of the mouth uh, or the tonsil. So insertion always have to be on an intubated patient and use your glidescope or your direct laryngoscope to help you guide the TEE probe. Let's talk a little bit about the sequence. So this looks like a complicated uh, slide, but I'm gonna briefly resume it that we're gonna go in four steps. So if you look on the right of the screen right here, you're gonna notice that we always start in the hypopharynx. So basically we are inserting the probe in the throat. And then we're gonna gently insert it until we hit what we call the mid-esophageal area. The mid-esophageal area is about 30 centimeter in about. When you're there, this is actually, if you had to have one view, that would be it, the mid-esophageal. You'll get so much information by getting this view. 
let's say you become fancy, you're a fellow or you're very interested in TE and you want to do a little bit more to that sequence, this is where you're going to go and look at these other views that I circled in purple. But for now, we're going to try to just um, uh, stick with the mid esophageal uh, four chamber view. Whoops. Okay, so that's just a, an illustration of that sequence. I'm starting in the mouth. And then that arrow down means that I'm going to push the probe down the throat. So it's going to go in the esophagus. And notice here, this is the omniplane wheel. I was telling you about the omniplane is that, you know, little uh, variation in the angle. We're at zero right now. So nothing to do. You just grab your probe. You insert it in the mouth. You go all the way down about 30 centimeter. And here you go. You're going to get your mid-esophageal four-chamber view. And again, if you had to have one view, that is perfect. If you decide to be a little bit more fancy, you could actually increase your omniplane angle, and then you're going to get what we call a bicaval view, where you can see, let's say you insert a central line, where your guide wire is going to right, enter right here, or you're going to see your IVC, and you're going to be able to use your IVC as part of your fluid responsive, um, fluid um, tolerance or fluid responsiveness evaluation. Let's say you would increase your uh, omniplane angle to 120, you're going to get this view. And I'm pretty sure you guys kind of recognize that it's very similar to the parasonal long axis view. It's just basically a flipped image because you're uh, going from behind the heart. So this is common images, right? You've seen that before. This looks like your apical four chamber. This looks like your parasternal long axis view. And then this one, well, it looks like the parasonal short axis view. So this is where you're going to be able to evaluate, let's say, for your gross cardiac function, where you're looking for wall motion abnormality, for example. But again, that's a tiny bit more advanced. So let me describe some of the views. And again, I know this is advanced. I just want to get you excited so you can start doing it very soon. So TEE views. The TEE is sometimes difficult to conceptualize. Um, these are great images. It's basically showing you that I'm inserting my probe. My omniplane, or my angle, is zero. Um, it's completely flat. Those probe um, waves are really flat right now, and I'm cutting the heart really into two. And that's called the mesosophageal view. And this is what it gives you, basically. Uh, oops. Is it working? Yep, so that's a nice view. So you're going to have your right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. Really similar to your apical fur chamber view. What can you see with that view? Okay, you can actually assess your left ventricular function, your right ventricular function, right? You suspect a massive PE, you're wondering if, you know, you've been coding this patient for 30 minutes, you're wondering if you should be thrombolizing this patient, and then all of a sudden, you notice a massive dilated RV. Um, well, maybe that, that, that's, the, that's the cause of your arrest. You can also look for those mitral valve and tricuspid valve, right? You see them quite well. You can also monitor for CPR quality. And again, you can always look to see if there's a presence of a big pericardial effusion. Uh, that would be something that you would have to, you know, perform an urgent pericardial synthesis. This is a great example. I think uh, for uh, us in the emergency department, one of the number one thing that we can help with is definitely the CPR quality. So you can notice on this video, this patient is in arrest, bradycardic arrest, and all of a sudden, they are starting chest compression you can actually see that they're compressing the right ventricle. So that's adequate. You want to make sure that you're not compressing too high. You're not compressing the left ventricular outflow tract, which actually was going to be uh, right here. Uh, because then you would basically impede all the flow uh, going forward uh, by poor end placement during your CPR. So a very, very good tool to evaluate CPR quality. Um, if we go in the, some of the more advanced views where I was telling you that you increase your omniplane, you increase your angle, and then what you're going to get is the mid-esophageal long axis view. So very similar to your parasternal uh, long axis view, where you can again assess your the ventricular function, your mitral valve, your aortic valve, and your aortic root. And then I just want to show you an example of where it can actually be useful to look at the aortic root, where you can clearly see a dissection flap, right? A dilated aortic root, and then this tiny little flap that is bouncing every time you have a systole. That's scary. So this is something you have to do something about. But really cool images. You can tell it's really, really, really crisp and sharp images. The my uh, mid-esophageal bicaval view, again, I didn't even touch my probe. I'm just playing with the, um, uh, the omniplane or that angle. The probe is there. You're not even um, uh, moving it uh, up and down the esophagus. It just stays in the mid-esophageal the whole time. And then you can assess um, the fluid status, for example, or guide wire placement. 
good responsiveness. This is a great video by uh, one of the TEE leaders here in Canada, where by doing this mid-table view during a code, guess what he found? A large clot. Well, you pretty much found the cause of your cardiac arrest at this time. Transgastric, I'm just going to um, talk to about briefly. This is the one image where you're going to have to push your probe all the way down to the stomach. And here we can see it's in, it's in the stomach, a little bit deeper. And where you're going to might have to do what we call anti-flexion, which is basically bring the probe in front like this using the big wheel. And then you're going to get this um, transgastric short axis view that is very similar to your paraspinal short axis view from your TTE. And again, you can assess your LV function, your RV function. Remember, LV, RV presence again of a pericardial effusion, and then the wall motion abnormality. Uh, briefly, uh, if let's say you would decide to do an evaluation of the aorta, once you're in the stomach, you just pull back and you're gonna be able to assess your aorta pretty much the whole way, all the way up. And this is actually the aorta illustrated here. Um, uh, and then sometimes you will be able to catch a dissection flap just like in this image right here. So let's say a very unstable patient where you evaluate the aorta and short axis, you're gonna be able to catch this. And sometimes big aneurysm also, but that's a little bit too advanced. Okay, I know, I know your eyes, you guys are all like little kittens, scared a little bit because this is too much goodness or just too much information or a tiny bit complicated. But again, today the goal was just to give you an introduction and hopefully to get you excited about a, a very nice technology that we're gonna have very soon. And that actually has been already there in many emergency departments in Quebec right now, as part of the care for cardiac arrest patients. Okay, you're gonna say, Lori, you're a little bit too advanced. Um, I don't think it's actually something that people are doing. Well, I'm gonna tell you that yes, there's actually a lot more research now. And even by the time I did this presentation a year or so ago, and I presented that um, uh, some of the most advanced course, uh, there was already research that was there. Not only there's research saying that it's feasible for staff, but it's definitely feasible for emergency medicine residents. And at the Jewish, we now have the simulator that's called the Vimedex that uh, we are hoping to be able to train our staff and our residents in terms of uh, making sure that everybody is trained to perform it in the future. And then this was published by ASEP, where they basically recommend guidelines for the training of uh, TEE uh, in, for emergency physicians, where they basically uh, say how much training do you need, how many insertions do you need, um, and then hopefully we're going to be able to implement this very soon in our emergency department, and it's going to basically benefit everyone because it's such a cool technology. So, you know, in those times where it's very difficult at work and, you know, sometimes I wish I just need a little bit of a hug. Actually, what I need is just a TEE probe to make me a lot happier in those days. So key points for today's presentation, ADTEE, it's actually safe and it's easy to perform. It's a simple sequence and it's a great tool for the emergency medicine resuscitationist. Cardiac arrest, definitely, shuck and dike section are coming in the near future. Um, so I hope I got you excited with this presentation. Um, I have a lot of resources regarding uh, this. I'm going to send a link to Audrey and Robert, uh, Robert uh, so you guys can share, uh, because it's cool to read a little bit. All the articles are short. Um, I can also send you the sequence that you keep keep in your phone for future uh, reference. And I am ready to take any questions you may have. Mm, yeah. I have a question, Laura. Yes. So uh, you know how, um, well, they say that usually um, a TE is not like good enough, like it's not good like a CT for diagnosing uh, aortic dissection, but is there any study showing the kind of like sensitivity for hemodynamically unstable aortic dissection? Because I'm, I'm assuming that if you have like, you're more unstable, you have a bigger dissection and you're maybe more likely to find it than the TE or no? So I'm presenting on this at AMUC actually in a month from now. Um, there's very little li literature because the aortic dissection is such a rare event. It's super rare. Um, I wanted to do that study, but then we realized that we had so little cases and so little people did a full uh, TTE sequence. And, you know, we're talking about the trans thoracic echo. In theory, when you do trans thoracic echo on someone unstable, you should find something uh, in theory. Um, not much literature regarding this. I'm going to try to look to see if recently there's anything that came out. Um, but I would expect to see at least a little something, a dilated aortic root, some sort of aortic regurge, 
um, a pericardial effusion. Um, there's a lot of little signs that you can get. The problem is you never know what's the patient's baseline. I don't know if you had aortic regurgitation before. Is that new? Is that not new? So I find that the TTE, when you don't see that classical, that classic flap, uh, and sometimes with cardiac ultrasound, there's many, many artifacts, okay, especially in that area of the valve. So it can be very tricky. So, so far, I would say that the literature doesn't really support that you will always find something, but I find that by experience, for those who are unstable, you will find a little something that will um, kind of give you a clue and then push you to really get that formal confirmation. And nearby CT or if too unstable, you call the cardi cardiology staff that to get that uh, or fellow to get that, um, that EEE down and emerge. And then perhaps one day we will be able to do that sequence. Not for now, I think you need to have some training to do this, this is an expert thing. I hope I'm answering your question. Yeah, thank you. Laurie, it's Bernie. Hello, Bernie. Thank you for bringing this. I'm looking forward to learning this. The fact that we'll be, we're gonna be in COVID now for the next little while, how will this change our usage of TEE? That is a great question. I think when the patient is intubated, in theory, you have this protection. Uh, I know that in the States, they're still doing it. And I, and I would argue that it's, um, that's it. It's part, it's once the patient is intubated, the things that you can do uh, are pretty much the same as you did before, right? We will start CPR, we will give compression, I'm sorry, we will give compression, we will give shock, we will continue the usual thing. Um, it's the, the, there was a lot of TEE discussions during the COVID pandemic. I have to look at those at those webinars, but people seem to be using it still. And um, yeah, so I, I know that it's a little bit scary and you might not want to do it on people. You know, you're always going to do it on people who are in cardiac arrest and who are intubated. So in my head, um, I don't think this is a problem in terms of, of generating aerosols. And if you think about the um, cleaning of the probe, so the probe is just like the endocavitary probe, you have to have a very high disinfection. So once you're done with it, you wrap it, you put it in a box, it has to be sent to um, uh, the cleaning place. I, it, I'm blanking on the proper term in English, but uh, the place where they do all the disinfections, and it's a very high um, level disinfection. And once it's back, the TEE probe has to be stored in a place where there's a continuous ventilation. Mm. So it's, it's, it's always very, very clean, this thing, because it's similarly to the endocavitary probe, you have no choice because of the possibility of uh, mm. transmitting infection. But I think there's definitely still a role for TEE, even in the COVID pandemic. Okay, thanks. And then I think Monica has a question in the spirit of our new academic department. Yes, of course, of course. Um, honestly, it's been... Uh, the thing we have to find a way to remove the barrier of uh, of the teaching and try to do some um, common training. The problem now with the COVID, everything has been hold in terms of the boot camp and everything. But I'm hoping that uh, by the end of this year we'll have a, a bit of a boot camp of TEE. I have to kind of still brush out how we're going to do this and if there's going to be a possibility of live insertion, uh, perhaps with anesthesia in our, our different hospitals uh, for us to, to try and train. But yeah, I definitely, Monica, I think it's a great suggestion and I'll keep that in mind when I write it up and make sure to disseminate to everyone. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, Lori. I'm pretty excited about TE uh, stuff as well now. Um, like a little kitten? Like a little kitten, exactly. Um, like my 